All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So first off, I want to welcome all of you to today's webinar on migrating to Hyper-V for VMware administrators. My name is Andy Sirwich, and I'm kind of going to be leading you through today's webinar, and uh, we've got a lot of great content for you here. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let me get my webcam on here so you can see my lovely smiling face. There we go. All right. Move that over here. So, again, hope everyone's having a good day so far. And uh, the first thing that we're going to cover is our agenda for the day. So, first thing we're going to do is we're going to get into some introductions. We're going to talk about Hyper-V architecture. Kind of get a, you're kind of going to get a a bit of a crash course on Hyper-V architecture and uh, you know the management differences. So that's going to be probably the first uh, half of our talk today. So you kind of have a good baseline of you know, kind of how things look and feel with Hyper-V, especially if you've never used it before. So um, I'll make sure to highlight some of the major differences between vSphere and Hyper-V uh, as we kind of go through those two sections. That way, you know, you have a better idea of how things work when we get to the second half of the webinar later today. Um, after that, we're going to cover some of the primary tools that are used for migrations to Hyper-V. We've got uh, disk to VHD, uh, the Microsoft Virtual Machine Converter, we're going to talk about Azure Site Recovery, and uh, and then we're going to talk about other options. So, and then finally, we're going to have some Q and A and wrap up at the end of the webinar today. Now, a quick mention on the Q and A. Um, please hold your questions to the end of the webinar. I mean, feel free to ask them using the question form throughout the webinar, but we won't actually answer any of them until we get to the Q&A section at the end. And uh, what we'll do is we usually set aside 10, 15 minutes for Q&A at the end, of the, uh, at the, end of, web of the webinar. And if for some reason we don't get through all of the questions during that time, I always like to do a, a follow-up blog post out on the Altero blog specifically to answer all those questions that didn't get covered during the webinar. So if you ask a question today and it doesn't get answered, be sure to check on our VMware blog at www.altero.com slash VMware uh, for a follow-up post that contains your question and the associated answer. So again, my name is, uh, is Andy Sirwich. And uh, I'm a technical evangelist with Altero Software, who's the sponsor of today's webinar. And uh, on top of that, I'm also a Microsoft Cloud and Data Center Management MVP. Um, used to be the Hyper-V competency, but uh, that it's now been fit into this Cloud and Data Center Management competency. So, um, you know, I, I've been in the industry for about 14 years now um, in a number of different capacities. Uh, before my time with Altero, I worked for uh, internal IT departments. I worked for managed services providers. Um, I've always been focused on infrastructure virtualization, storage, cloud services, the Microsoft server stack. Um, and, you know, I've got Hyper-V plastered all over my bio here. But, you know, because we're talking about VMware in this webinar as well, I kind of want to mention that, you know, I've often worked with VMware quite a lot as well. So in this webinar, we're talking about migrating from VMware to Hyper-V. And my career has very much kind of gone in that direction. Um, my first introduction to virtualization was with, with vSphere. Um, I cut my teeth on ESX 3 and 3.5, so I've uh, definitely been involved in VMware for many, many years. Uh, during my time working for an, an MSP here in the, uh, the Midwest region in the U.S., um, I, I spent basically all of my day uh, supporting a hosted cloud infrastructure that was based on VMware. So very, very familiar with vSphere. Uh, and very familiar with Hyper-V as well. So um, I always like to have these talks where we kind of compare and contrast the two and uh, help folks figure out how to move from one to the other. <clears throat> so a little bit of uh, mention here about today's sponsor. Again, my employer, Altero Software. We're a fast-growing developer of easy-to-use, user-friendly backup software. Pretty awesome software. Um, we're trusted by 30,000 customers and 6,000 partners. And that flagship product of ours is Altero VM Backup. If you're interested in more information on that product, feel free to go out to altero.com slash VM dash backup for more information. <clears throat> so whenever I have this particular discussion, whenever, whenever I'm doing a presentation that involves both Hyper-V and VMware, I always have a slide like this. So 
let's just set some expectations right from the get-go. So what this presentation is not is, it's not gonna be a bashing session. Um, I'm not gonna say, you know, oh, Hyper-V is better than VMware, or VMware is better than Hyper-V. I always like to take an objective look at both platforms, what their advantages and disadvantages are, what are the differences, and how do you get from one to the other. So in this case, we're talking about going from VMware to Hyper-V. Now, a lot of people ask me, well, Andy, you know, you, uh, you're you a Hyper-V guy, so you, you must prefer Hyper-V. Well, you know, if I'm honest with myself, yes, I prefer Hyper-V, but I like both solutions. I really do. I like vSphere too. They make a fantastic product. And um, really, at the end of the day, it all comes down to whose ecosystem do you want to be in, right? Uh, I mean, both products, they, they provide all kinds of fantastic solutions for infrastructure, for virtual machines, uh, for storage now too. I mean, you think about vSAN and, uh, and storage spaces direct on the Hyper-V side. Um, I mean, both solutions are they're mature, they're great solutions, and again, like I said, at the end of the day, it just depends whose ecosystem do you really wanna be in. So again, like I said, just setting some expectations, not gonna bash one solution over the other, just taking an objective look, because a lot of folks are finding themselves in this situation now, they're having to migrate from one to the other for whatever reason, um, and uh, it really helps to have the skill sets with each platform in case you ever find yourself in that type of situation. So like I mentioned earlier, we're going to start with a crash course in Hyper-V. So the first thing we're going to talk about is some architecture. Then we're going to talk briefly about installation, and then we're going to get into the different management tools. Because I find one of the places that VMware administrators struggle with the most when it comes to Hyper-V is management of the solution. And you'll find, you know, I'll talk about why here uh, shortly. <clears throat> So first thing, let's talk about Hyper-V architecture. You're going to find that the architecture of Hyper-V is very, very similar to VMware. Very similar. So you could have a standalone Hyper-V host, just like you have a standalone ESXi host. Maybe it's a, a small business, you know, maybe it's a, you know, a couple person shop. They need a hypervisor and a couple of servers running on it. Hyper-V certainly has the ability to run a single as a single hypervisor and host some VM. So you have your single hypervisor and you've got your VM traffic going out to the network. So that's that's doable. That's a very common solution, very much like so on the ESXi side. Now, Hyper-V also has the ability to cluster. So let's say that I've got two Hyper-V hosts and I want to have uh, high availability between the two of them. That way, uh, my virtual machines can tolerate a host failure, just like HA and VMware. And I can do that very much like you do on the vSphere side. So what you have to do is I need some sort of storage that is visible to both Hyper-V hosts, just like you do in vSphere. Um, this could be, you know, a traditional SAN that's presented via iSCSI or fiber channel. It could be uh, storage spaces direct, which again is Microsoft's equivalent of vSAN. Um, could just be a, an SMB3 file share. Um, the lab that I'm going to show you here in a second, um, all of my VMs are stored on just an SMB file share uh, on a file server. So uh, lots of different options when it comes to storage, just like the vSphere side. Um, and once you've got that storage presented, you can generate that cluster and now you can start sending that cluster traffic over a switch, you know, over your switching network. You can start presenting that VM traffic to your, your end users. Um, and it's very, very similar to the, um, to the vSphere model. So, um, you know, I talk to a lot of IT pros that are on the VMware side and, you know, they kind of think this Hyper-V architecture is kind of a mysterious thing, you know. They, um, they assume that it's, that it's different and really, you know, at the most base level, yes, the software is different, but I mean, from a, a design perspective, you know, it looks very, very much the same. Now let's talk, you know, installation. Um, this is one common area that a lot of people get hung up. Um, if you've worked with licensing in your vSphere environment, this left-hand column here is going to look very similar because you have similar concerns on the vSphere side. So for Windows Edition options, you know, what edition of Windows are you going to use for your Hyper-V hosts? Um, you know, you can choose any edition of Windows. 
There's a couple of different versions. I'll start with Hyper-V Server. So uh, this is actually a free SKU of Windows Server. It contains just the roles needed for Hyper-V. So that's Hyper-V, that's failover clustering, um, that's MPIO, um, and you know any other core feature that is required for Hyper-V. Um, it runs in Windows Server Core mode, which means you know you don't have the traditional UI. You have a command line. You've got Task Manager, um, Notepad, just some other basic system utilities um, to help you manage that machine locally. As far as managing the hypervisor itself, you have to remotely connect using the RSAT tools, and uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, I always like to highlight that this is probably the most similar to ESXi minus a new option that has come up recently, which I'll talk about here in just a second. Um, the other thing I like to point out with Hyper-V Server is that there is no licensing included with this. So um, again, it's a free SKU. You go out and download it. If you use it in production, Microsoft assumes that if you're going to run Windows Server VMs on it, you have that licensing already in some other way, shape, or form. So just keep that in mind. If you use Hyper-V Server, your licensing has to come from elsewhere. Standard Edition, you can use Windows Server Standard Edition. It's uh, you know it's complete Windows Server. You can run it in any mode, full UI, server core. Um, and it allows you to run up to two operating system environments. So you know that's fancy legal speak for VMs operating system environments, you know, VM. So that allows you to run two virtual machines, uh, two Windows virtual machines on top of that physical Hyper-V host. And then your final version here, data center edition, exactly the same as standard for the most part, minus a couple of uh, storage related features. Um, you know, the big difference here is, is instead of just two operating system environments, you've got unlimited. So as many VMs as you want. <clears throat> Um, in the, uh, you know, we talk about Windows Server 2016, we've got this new, <clears throat> excuse me, allergy season here in the U.S. Um, you talk about Windows Server 2016, we've got this new concept of Hyper-V containers. That question often comes up when I'm talking about this. Uh, Hyper-V container counts as an OSE, so keep that in mind. Now, what about operating system options? You know, you heard me talk about Windows Server Core a second ago. Um, there's a couple of different ways that you can install the Hyper-V host. You can choose a full server with a GUI. This is probably best for small installations where, like I mentioned earlier, you've got kind of that mom and pop shop, a um, couple of users, uh, and you want to have the management tools directly on the host. A full server with a GUI is a good option for that um, because, again, you've got all those tools right there on the host. You don't have to worry about having a, you know, a management workstation somewhere that's part of that domain. The other option we've got is server core. Um, it's really considered to be kind of the best balance between low overhead and uh, and uh, allows you to kind of have some management on the host still. Uh, you know, you've got PowerShell on the host. You've got some basic tools available on the host itself for management, and um, it's 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 pretty nice. It's it's stripped down enough to where you don't have to worry about a ton of reboots for patching, um, and it's it's a nice middle ground between that and this new option in Windows Server 2016 called Nano Server. Nano server, um, nano server is completely headless. You log in and look at the console of a nano server host and you have um, a menu with maybe two options. You can configure some networking and firewall rules and that's about it. So getting it connected, that's really much, you know, pretty much all you can do on the, uh, on the console itself. Other than that, 100% remote management. Now, it provides the lowest overhead, and it is absolutely the most secure of all the different options here. Um, it follows um, Microsoft's concept of only installing what is absolutely needed on the host to get the job done. Um, so it's extremely stripped down, and it's extremely small, takes 20 seconds to boot, um, even less than that in some cases, depending on your storage. Um, and it's pretty darn good for Hyper-V hosts. So if you want maximum amount of resources to go to your, your VMs and you want the most secure and the lowest amount of reboots needed for patches, Nano Server is your option. Now, I always like to talk about a couple of common Hyper-V myths. So I'm going to do a little bit of myth busting when it comes to Hyper-V. And I talk to a lot of IT pros that are coming from vSphere over to Hyper-V like I did uh, in my career. 
And uh, these are some common misconceptions that I run into quite frequently. So the first, you need System Center Virtual Machine Manager if you want clustering in HA. Now, I, I get where this misconception comes from. So on the vSphere side, if I want clustering in HA, I need vCenter, right? I mean, that's, you know, that's just, uh, that's just the way vSphere works. And it's, you know, it's common knowledge for anyone that's worked with vSphere on a uh, regular basis. And a lot of people on the VMware side, they associate System Center Virtual Machine Manager or VMM or SCVMM for short. Um, they associate that with vCenter and they assume that it's required for clustering in HA. And that's, that's, not, that's not a fact. That's, uh, that's a myth. Um, you can get clustering in HA and Hyper-V without SCVMM. Um, when Microsoft started developing this and they started thinking of ways to, to, you know, to do clustering in HA, um, they didn't really need to reinvent the wheel a whole lot because they already had Windows Server failover clustering. So really, when you want a Hyper-V cluster and you want HA capabilities in Hyper-V, you actually install the failover clustering role inside of Windows and you set up a failover cluster just like you would for any other major Windows service that you want a failover cluster for. <clears throat> Our next common myth is you can't create templates without SCVMM. Um, and as um, it depends on what your definition of a template is. Now, uh, SCVMM actually defines an image as a template, and you can actually store templates in kind of a library with SCVMM. But you can do it with just a standard Hyper-V host as well. So, for example, if you want to create a gold image with Hyper-V, you create your VM, you get it exactly how you want it, you patch it, you get it all ready to go, you sysprep it, and then you copy that VHD, or you just move that VHD into a storage location, get rid of the virtual machine, and that VHD is essentially your template. So what you do is you embed an answer file into that VHD, and anytime you want to deploy your template, copy that VHD, fashion a new VM out of it. When it boots up, it'll run that answer file, and your machine will be customized just like it was a template. So it is possible without SCVMM, and I always like to point that out as well. Another common myth, Hyper-V isn't as secure as ESXi because it's Windows. Um, you know, and it's been kind of a running joke over the last decade that, oh, hey, you know, Windows isn't as secure, blah de blah uh, Well, you know, when we're talking about hypervisors and, you know, we're talking about the nano server and the server core options, um, Hyper-V is very, very secure. It's a very secure hypervisor. Um, the hypervisor itself is quite small. Um, you know, they sure, they use the Windows kernel for certain things, but the Windows kernel itself is, is very secure as well. Uh, the problem comes when you're adding on software like web browsers and, and um, uh, you know, all the other things that get installed inside of the GUI on the server. So when you're going with the server core and especially the nano server option, um, you're not running a, GU a GUI on the server. You're not running all of these, these pieces of software that are, are susceptible to attack. Um, you're running a more lean, streamlined uh, host that is very secure, and really you shouldn't have any concerns when running Hyper-V in that fashion. Uh, physical domain controllers required for clustering. So if anyone, anyone that's ever set up uh, failover clustering, um, you know, domain controller is often a requirement for clustering. There are some cases where you can get by without a domain controller, but um, for the best results, for the best experience, for the most ease of use, you're going to want uh, a domain controller, you know, a domain present in some way, shape, or form. Now, I don't know where this particular myth come from, but I, I, I've run into this a lot of times where people think that, hey, I need a physical DC in my environment in case, you know, one of the hosts, you know, falls over and dies. Um, you know, I would have said back in the 2008 R2 Hyper-V days, I would have, I would have wanted a physical DC around. But since 2012 R2 and now 2016, there's enough logic built into clustering and Hyper-V itself to where you can virtualize your domain controllers on top of your hypervisors. You can set up anti-affinity rules to make sure that those DCs are on separate hosts at all time. That way, if you do have a host failure, AD is still present somewhere else in the cluster, 
and you're good to go. So a physical DC is not a requirement for clustering. And I always like to point that one out as well. And I think our final one here is Hyper-V does not scale as high as VMware. I used to not talk about this particular bullet point in these conversations, um, but there's always that one guy that wants to, <laughs> wants to talk about it. Um, to me, this is kind of a moot point. I mean, both solutions, they scale ridiculously high that only, you know, the Googles and the, the Amazons and the, you know, the large enterprise of the world would ever potentially hit that number. And we'll, we'll, we'll see some of those numbers here in just a second. So I mentioned those numbers and here they are. So, I mean, these are 2016 Hyper-V numbers. I mean, 2016 Hyper-V, I mean, you can, you can assign uh, 240 vCPUs per VM. 12 terabytes of memory per VM. Um, the virtual disk capacity in Hyper-V is 64 terabytes. You can run over 1,000 VMs on a physical host. You can do 64 physical nodes per failover cluster. I mean, it's, it's just astronomical. I mean, you know, most, most businesses are not even in a place where they could even dream about hitting these maximums. And that's why I say it's kind of a moot point. It doesn't really matter. You know, if I was talking about VMware right now, I'd be putting up similar numbers and I'd be saying the same thing. It just doesn't really matter. I mean, it's going to be able to handle your use case and really that's the important thing, right? <clears throat> so, managing Hyper-V. So, it's a bit different than vSphere and this is uh, where things start to differ a little bit. So, and I will say that um, this is one area where I probably like uh, vSphere a little bit better. Um, because vSphere kind of has that all-in-one management tool in vCenter, right? It's kind of your one-stop shop for managing everything there is to do with the solution. Whereas with Microsoft, they're using a lot of their existing tool sets, and you kind of have to jump around a bit based on your particular environment and your use case. So we have up to four potential management interfaces. First is Hyper-V Manager, which is what you see on the screen here. And this is probably what most people are most familiar with. Um, Hyper-V Manager is great for small one to two host setups where clustering is not in the picture. Um, and then we have Failover Clustering Manager, which you'll see here shortly. Um, you, a lot of people don't know this. You can actually use Failover Cluster Manager to manage Hyper-V. So that's designed to be used when you've got a small cluster in play, um, small to medium-sized clusters, I would say. And it's, it's great for that use case, and I'll show you here shortly. Uh, SCVMM is really intended for large enterprise clusters. So again, I kind of mentioned a lot of people make the correlation that, you know, uh, uh, vCenter and SCVMM are kind of the same thing, different platforms. That's not really the case. Um, SCVMM, you really only need it when you have massive deployments. Um, a lot of people ask me the question, well, how many hosts? How many hosts should I have before I start thinking about a CVMM? And over the years, um, my number has steadily increased. Um, I've gone from 10 to 20. Now I'm saying if you've got 40 hosts or more, then maybe it's time to start worrying about SCVMM. But you can do a lot with uh, the other three management utilities uh, without requiring SCVMM. Um, PowerShell is there for all your automation workloads as well. Anything that you can do in the GUI, you can do in PowerShell and then some. There are some functions that are PowerShell only. Um, but it's great for automation and scripting. <coughs> so I wanted to show the management utilities real quick. So I'm going to pop over into this lab here. So I've got a lab that is running a couple of different Hyper-V hosts. So this first host that I'm, I'm looking at is just a standalone host. It's this uh, Ando MB HV3 standalone host in this lab, and it's just running a single VM right now. So it's not doing anything fancy. <clears throat> now, the first time you install a host, um, there's a couple of different things that you need to do. You need to come in here to Hyper-V Manager. You need to uh, you know, add it into Hyper-V Manager. Again, Hyper-V Manager is just an MMC snap-in, uh, very similar to a lot of the other management tools on the Hyper-V side. And uh, you got a number of different things that you can do here. Um, Hyper-V settings is probably, <coughs> excuse me, Hyper-V settings is probably uh, the first area that you're going to want to go into because here you control a lot of the, you know, a lot of the behaviors of the hypervisor itself. 
you know, you get to specify, okay, where am I storing my virtual machines? Um, <clears throat> you know, so here are the virtual hard disks. Again, you can, you know, I mentioned earlier, I'm using an SMB share to actually store my VMs. Um, virtual machines is kind of where the supporting files for the virtual machine get stored. I can configure NUMA, <clears throat> I can configure live migration, um, AKA vMotion. Live migration is uh, Microsoft's version of vMotion, so you can configure that here. Um, this is where you can actually define what IP addresses to use for live migration. Now, this is a standalone host, um, so people often ask, well, why is live migration here for a standalone host? Well, Microsoft has the ability <clears throat> to um, do, uh, do live migrations from standalone host to other standalone hosts just like vSphere does. So, and you can control that behavior here. Storage migrations, you know, kind of the same thing for moving just storage on the vSphere side. Um, enhanced session mode, um, you know, very similar to um, some of the advanced console features in vSphere, and that's what enhanced session mode is here. Um, and uh, replication, Hyper-V includes uh, replication as part of the uh, as part of the platform so you can actually replicate vms to another hyper v host somewhere um, to kind of act as a dr type of solution if need be and the rest are just um just uh things that have to do with you know how virtual machines behave when you're connecting to them through this platform um, the other really important thing in here is virtual switch manager so, you know, just kind of the same thing as vSphere, creating vSwitches. Um, you come in here to do that. I have a single vSwitch defined. Um, when you create a new one, you'll have three different options. An external vSwitch is obviously exactly how it sounds. It connects you to the external world, uh, and it associates a physical NIC on the host with that vSwitch, just like in vSphere. Uh, internal allows communication between the virtual machines that are part of that switch and the host. Private is exactly the same as internal, with the exception that the host is not included in that communication. So a couple of different options there. Uh, in the sake of time, I'm kind of I'm kind of scooting through here, um, but really, I mean, this is you know that's kind of the gist of it. I mean, you can manage your virtual machines um, just like your virtual machines in vSphere. You right click, you say settings, and it will actually bring up the settings dialog for that virtual machine. <clears throat> running a lot of this stuff, a lot of these hosts as nested hypervisors on top of my laptop. Um, so they are not the speediest thing right now because of that, especially because I got the webcam going, my CPU on my laptop is uh, just chugging right now. But you, you can see that you've got a lot of the same hardware related settings as you do inside of vSphere. You know, I can configure memory, CPUs, you know, connected hard drives. Um, you know, I configure checkpoints. So checkpoints in Hyper-V are the same as snapshots in VMware, just different terminology, <clears throat> similar behavior, um, and all of your different VM associated items are contained in this view here. <clears throat> now, this is the tool for, like I said, standalone Hyper-V hosts, or maybe when you have just a couple of hosts um, that you want to manage. Failover Cluster Manager is the tool that you want to use when you are managing multiple Hyper-V hosts that are part of a cluster. So you can see I've got a cluster up here called Ando MBHV Cluster, um, and this is the domain that it's associated with. Um, roles, I can see um, the different virtual machines that are contained in this cluster. I have just, just two virtual machines inside of this cluster right now. Um, and nodes, this is where I can go to view the physical nodes of the workstation, uh, the physical nodes of the cluster. I'm actually going to kill my webcam for a second. That way I get a little bit more speed here. <clears throat> that should free us up. There we go. Okay, so I can see the uh, the different nodes that I've got as part of this cluster. So I can see HV1, HV2, you know, how many votes do they have in the cluster? So very similar to uh, the vSphere side as far as determining whether the cluster is up or not. Uh, in the case of an even number of, uh, of nodes in the cluster, you have to configure what's called a, a disk quorum or a file share quorum. It's basically just the same idea where in vSphere it chooses a data store to use as another, as another vote essentially to determine whether the cluster is up and running. Um, 
and you can do that in the uh, failover cluster manager here by right clicking more actions and configure cluster quorum settings now again i mentioned that you can use a a um you know a small uh, a small LUN. If you're using like a traditional SAN to present storage into your Hyper-V host, you can you can choose a uh, a small LUN. You can use a file share on, a, on an SMB3 file server, um, or uh, Microsoft now has the option of using an Azure Cloud Witness um, as a vote here as well. So a couple of different options for doing that. Um, and I mean, managing the virtual machines from this view are very much the same as managing them from Hyper-V Manager. You know, I can um, I can right click if I want to, and I can get to all the different stuff that we saw on Hyper-V Manager. Um, you know, I've got uh, a couple of different uh, options over here. You know, startup priority if I want a certain virtual machine to start up first. Um, I can configure replication just like I did in uh, Hyper-V Manager, and a lot of the, the stuff that you're used to seeing. Um, if, when you want to actually create another virtual machine, you can do that from the virtual machines tab here. Um, and then the other thing that I always like to point out here, um, HA in vSphere is per cluster, right? You enable HA on the cluster and every virtual machine is instantly enabled for HA. That's where it differentiates with Hyper-V here. Hyper-V allows you to granularly choose which VMs are HA enabled. Now you can, you can kind of do that in the vSphere side as well. But in Hyper-V, it's done that way by default. Um, you have to actually configure, um, if you've created your virtual machines in Hyper-V Manager and you later want them to be HA enabled, you actually have to come into, into Failover Cluster Manager here, say configure role, and then you would select type virtual machine, select the VM, work through the wizard, and it would enable it for HA. That kind of throws some people off. Um, if you're using a cluster, if you've got a Hyper-V cluster and you want to create some new virtual machines, um, come in here to Failover Cluster Manager and create it. Because when you create a virtual machine inside of Failover Cluster Manager, it will automatically enable it for HA. So I always like to like to mention that to people when they are creating VMs. Because what happens is they create it in Hyper-V Manager and you know they, they think it's HA enabled. Three months goes by, they lose a host in the cluster, and why didn't that mission critical SQL server stay online? Um, or you know fail over automatically, and that's often a uh, a common reason. A um, couple of other things to mention in here. Uh, I always like to come up here to the cluster properties, and this is a new feature that they've added in in Windows Server 2016. This balancer tab. So for those of you that are used to vSphere DRS, this is the Hyper-V equivalent of DRS. So. Um, it doesn't require SCVMM. You get it with just failover cluster manager. You enable this automatic load balancing, and um, you set the aggressiveness down here. Um, and when it load balances, either always or when a node joins a cluster, or a couple of different options there. So that's the Hyper-V equivalent of DRS without SCVMM. Um, the other point I want to, the thing I wanted to point out here is networks. So we talked about live migration, again, aka vMotion earlier. Um, uh, you can configure the way that live migration behaves um, right from this view inside of cluster manager as well. So I got this cluster, I come up here to live migration settings, and you can choose which cluster network you want to use for live migration. So a lot of people like to have a couple of dedicated links on each host, specifically for live migration or vMotion. Um, if you have a number of different physical NICs attached to your Hyper-V host, I only have one in this lab for, for lab purposes, but you'd see a number of different cluster networks here depending on different IP addresses, different subnets, et cetera, et cetera. And you could configure how all those behave here. <clears throat> And then finally, um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to cover uh, SCVMM just because that is probably a whole webinar in and of itself. And again, it's more geared towards enterprises. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention here real quick is um, PowerShell. So I mentioned PowerShell is the other, the other management option for Hyper-V. Um, you know, you've got a number of different commands. So if I just run a get command dash module and I, I return all the stuff from the Hyper-V module, I just get a ton of different stuff. Uh, and again, 
anything that you can do in the GUI in Hyper-V, you can do in PowerShell and then some. Um, you'll find not only some Hyper-V related stuff in the Hyper-V module, but you'll also find a bunch of stuff in the failover cluster module. Because again, Microsoft is using failover clustering to actually facilitate that kind of HA functionality. Uh, additionally, um, you know, if you want to actually manage VMs, you can. So if I just remote in, use PowerShell remoting to remote into uh, Hyper-V host 2, <clears throat> I can actually do things like get VM. Tell me which VMs are running on the machine. So if I run get VM, it'll return a list of all the running VMs. So I can see I've got my two virtual machines, what their CPU usage looks like, um, you know, what the memory assigned is, their uptime, just some kind of some basic statistics. That's just an example of how you can use uh, Hyper-V to actually manage some of those machines. <clears throat> so, all right, so let's, uh, let's switch back to the slide deck here. Again, that was kind of a crash course in, uh, in Hyper-V architecture, and we touched a little bit on management. <clears throat> uh, but we also want to want to talk about some of the tools that you can use to actually um, get your virtual machines over to Hyper-V. Uh, and this is the part of the conversation where things start to get... Um, they start to get a little interesting. Um, the migration story around Hyper-V has, has changed a lot over the last couple of years. And um, <clears throat> with that, the, the types of tools that are being used, um, where you use them, it, it, it's changed a lot over, the, over the, the, the last couple of years. And you'll kind of see as we start stepping through the various tools, I'll kind of explain, explain why and how. Um, this is another area where I feel like uh, VMware kind of has a one-up on Hyper-V because you've got your vSphere converter, and that's pretty much your tool that does it all, right? Um, Microsoft has a number of different tools available. And um, again, like I said, have changed uh, have changed the story a lot over the last couple of years. So the first one I want to talk about is um, <clears throat> Disk to VHD. So this tool is uh, actually a Sys internals tool, written by uh, Mark Rusinovich, who works for Microsoft. Um, it's a great tool. I mean, it's it's kind of your uh, your Ford truck version of uh, of a P to V utility or a V to V utility, however you want to use it. Um, it's reliable. It works very well. Um, it's free to download and use. You know, it's kind of a basic low-end utility for converting a running system to a VHD or a VHDX. So essentially what you do is you run it on the system that you want to convert. <clears throat> It'll use volume shadow copy inside of that machine. It'll create a VHDX wherever you tell it to put it. You take that VHDX, you move it over into your hypervisor storage, you create a new VM, and instead of creating new a new virtual disk as part of that VM, you attach the uh, VHDX that you created as using this uh, part of using this utility. There are some very basic CLI type of functions for this tool, um, so you can do some basic scripting functionality. Um, but again, it's kind of very basic, um, kind of a manual um, get the job done type of tool. The next thing that we have is um, Microsoft Virtual Machine Converter. And this tool, it has something of a, an interesting history. Um, you know, it really had a lot of potential. And I say had because the tool is officially deprecated. Um, it's still available until about mid-June, so next month. Um, and if you really read the press notice about it being deprecated, they are going to actually remove the download. So if you want to use this tool, uh, I suggest you go grab it. Uh, I've got the bit.ly link for it right there uh, underneath the picture on the left-hand side of the slide. Um, you know, it supports vCenter 4.1, 5.1, 5.5 as the source. Um, personally, I've never tried it myself with anything newer than 5.5, but I've heard rumors that it works. But again, I can't say that myself with any certainty. Um, supports hardware versions 4, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Uh, the destination can be a Hyper-V 2008 R2 or 2012 R2, or this tool can even go to an Azure VHD as well if you'd like it to. Um, you've got a number of different supported guest operating systems. 
Uh, online conversions require that the firewall this be disabled, RDP is enabled, um, and the proper per permissions are set on all the storage locations where you're actually sending the, uh, the virtual machine. Uh, for Linux conversions, SSH has to be installed uh, and the root credentials have to be enabled. Uh, sudo is not supported. So if you run a uh, distribution of Linux like Ubuntu uh, that uses sudo by default, you have to make sure you run passwd on your root account to set up a password for your root account and actually use that when you do the conversion. Um, <clears throat> the next thing is the, uh, the MAT is uh, what it's called for short, but the Migration Automation Toolkit. Again, had potential, but it's now deprecated. Really, this was an add-on for MVMC. Um, and really, it was just a collection of automation scripts for MVMC. Um, there's a number of scripts. It was backed by SQL Express, and you, you could run mass conversion jobs, um, you know, large numbers of VMs all at once. You know, say maybe you had two, three, four hundred VMs that needed to be migrated. Uh, this tool has the capabilities of doing that. Um, and it's scalable if you wanted to install the tool on multiple machines, you know, worker machines. Um, to actually do the conversions, you could install it in several locations. Uh, and it required that PowerCLI be available as well. Um, if you're interested in that tool, I've got the bit.ly link for it right there as well. Again, deprecated, but, you know, it's still, it still works today um, for the most part. Now, here's another area where things get interesting. So, um, we talk about the deprecation of MVMC and the migration automation toolkit. And, um, you know, where my mind automatically goes is, okay, well, they're deprecating this tool that we've used for, you know, however long. What, what's it being replaced by? And the official word from Microsoft is that Azure Site Recovery is going to be the tool that is being used going forward for doing conversions. Now, <clears throat> it's a good tool. It works for what it's intended for, um, which is, you know, vaulting workloads into Azure to, uh, to act as a DR target, basically. And, you know, by proxy, it kind of acts as a conversion tool for Hyper-V, but there are a number of different caveats. Um, if, if I'm going from VMware to Hyper-V on-premise, first thing I have to do is I have to set up Azure Site Recovery, which uh, the, the hardware requirements are just, are just massive. So you see here the third bullet point on the, on the slide. I need a dedicated server on-site with 16 gigs of memory, eight CPU cores, 1.2 terabytes, yes, terabytes of storage, now, those are all recommendations. Um, you know, when I set this up last, I actually shorted some of those requirements a little bit, and the installer yells at you all along the way, but it lets you move forward. Um, <clears throat> but those are the official software requirements from Microsoft. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, I mean, a lot of businesses, small businesses, a lot of people don't have that type of hardware lying around to be able to do that. So, I mean, really, those... Those, those hardware requirements are, are kind of astronomical if you think about it. The other problem with this is in order to actually do that conversion, I have to let Azure Site Recovery sync that machine into Azure. And then what I need to do from there, I need to then download the VHD and create my VM on site. So you think about that, I'm sending that payload across the WAN twice in order to, con in order to facilitate that conversion. Um, so that's, that's kind of a problem. The other thing that Azure Site Recovery can do is if you've got two VMware sites, um, you, can, it, you can have it act as the orchestration for syncing between the two sites, but uh, that doesn't help you in going from VMware to Hyper-V on-premise. So, um, you know, it's kind of an interesting tool. Uh, I'd like to see how they improve it moving forward. Um, if you want more information about it, I've got the URL there at the bottom right. Um, and, you know, I'm sure there's some stuff on uservoice.microsoft.com where you can actually go in and you can vote for additional functionality. Um, they say this is going to be the tool moving forward, but I haven't seen them make any uh, major improvements for Hyper-V migrations in the, you know, the recent past. So uh, this will just be one that we need to keep our eyes out on, and uh, hopefully they add that functionality for us. Um, 
going forward. Uh, one other thing I want to mention here, a lot of people have concerns that, well, if I'm, if I'm vaulting a machine into Azure, aren't there some costs associated with that? Well, Microsoft says when you use this service, um, the first 31 days, there's no cost for using ASR. So um, as long as you complete your migration in the first 31 days um, and you've pulled everything out of Azure, there's no additional cost, basically. So, um, so I mean, you look at those tools, and you know, as far as official tools go, they they're not 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 any one of them is like a fully functional P to V or V to V migration tool. Yes, D to, disk to VHD, um, I use it all the time. It's a great tool, um, but you know, sometimes when I want to do a lot of conversion jobs. Um, it just gets a little bit tedious. Um, there are some alternatives. SCVMM, <clears throat> it has uh, native P2V capabilities or V2V capabilities built right into it. Now, I say that with an asterisk, if I could put an asterisk on my words. Um, that has something, that is something that has changed a couple of times in the past. So, it used to be in SCVMM, and then they took it out for a while, and now they've added it back. So, you know, even that, that migration capabilities inside of Virtual Machine Manager have been questionable over the last, uh, the last couple of years. So that leaves us with, you know, third-party conversion utilities uh, or what uh, Microsoft says, you know, they're Microsoft software partners. There's a lot of companies out there that make, you know, little, you know, P the per virtual machine that you want to migrate. And those are those are those are usually great options, but again, it is an added cost, so that's something that you have to take into account. And then the other thing that I like to point out, you know, if the workload is easily movable, consider just migrating the workload. So instead of actually moving the VM, build a new VM and migrate the uh, the payload inside of it. Um, I see a lot of people try to P to V or V to V domain controllers, and I think you know AD is something that's very easily movable. Why not just you know, build some new DCs, move your FISMO roles, and away you go. Um, so if it's something like that, that's definitely something that you might want to consider. <clears throat> so that kind of wraps up our content. Um, I want to talk about our product, Altera VM Backup version 7 real quick. Um, actually, 7.1 now. Um, <clears throat> but again, you know, we, uh, we focus on a number of different things with our product. Um, we focus on efficient backup setup. We want you to get up and running quickly. Um, we want the interface to be easy to use, um, but with that ease of use, we really focus on giving you full control of your backups as well. So we provide all the powerful capabilities that you're used to seeing in a backup application, deduplication, uh, encryption, compression, those types of things. Uh, the other thing that we really, really focus on is a very positive support experience. We don't do tiered support at Altero. You're not going to get the whole, have you tried turning it off and turning it back on again type of thing when you call support you're going to get a product expert that owns your issue from a to b um, the other thing that i want to mention is our product now supports vSphere 6.5 uh, with our 7.1 update so if you've got 7.5 and you need uh, if you're uh, got 6.5 and um, you know you're interested in our product we now support that version as well um, one thing that I also wanted to mention is we've got uh, a new deduplication technology baked into our, our uh, version 7 of our application. Um, it's some of the best deduplication on the market. Our devs really did a fantastic job with it. It's uh, lowered storage uh, requirements significantly, allows you to perform much faster backups. Uh, it's fully in line, so only the blocks that absolutely need to go across the wire go across the wire. Uh, when we compared our uh, deduplication to some of our competitors over there on the right, we've come in at uh, much lower than some of our competitors. So we've been pretty happy with the performance thus far. Uh, and then, you know, if you're kind of curious what our UI looks like, like I said, we really focus on ease of use. Um, we really try to keep a nice, clean, easy to figure out UI. And this is a kind of a picture of the dashboard here. Uh, if you're, again, if you're interested in more information about our product, go to altera.com slash vm backup. Or if you want to download a 30-day uh, a full-feature trial or a free version that's free for two VMs forever, you can go to altero.com slash download. <clears throat> now, we've got a little time for some Q&A. So, again, a quick mention on the Q&A. Um, I hope you guys have been putting your questions in as they've been coming up. But if you haven't and you have a question, feel free to put it in the uh, questions form in GoToMeeting. 
And again, if we don't get to all the questions during the Q&A today, um, I always do a follow-up post for my webinars out on our Altero blog. So in this case, altero.com slash VMware. Keep an eye on that blog. Um, in the coming weeks, we'll have a copy of the webinar, copy of the slide deck, any supporting materials, and a full list of all the questions and all their associated answers, even the ones that don't get answered live today. Uh, if you want to sign up for uh, some reminders, um, if you want to get a notification when that post is live, you can go to altero.com slash VMware slash sign up, and uh, you can sign up to receive notifications for when that post is live. So with that said, let me get the questions form out here. And again, if you have questions, keep them coming. Keep them coming. Have them come right through the, uh, through the questions form, and I will see what I can do here. So, <clears throat> um, so uh, first question, does vSphere and Hyper-V support GPU-intensive VMs? Yeah, both, both hypervisors have the capabilities of utilizing um, a GPU inside of the host. So both of them support that option if that's something you're looking for. Um, where that really comes into play most often is uh, VDI scenarios. So in the case where you want to actually host up some desktops for um, your users. Um, on uh, the VMware side, that's VMware Horizon View is their solution. On the Hyper-V side, um, it kind of piggybacks on top of RDS and uh, ties into Hyper-V as well to utilize those, uh, to create and utilize those virtual desktops. Um, let's see, another question here. Um, Azure Site Recovery, do we have to pay for the process server in Azure? Um, that's a good question. I was actually looking at that yesterday um, in preparation of this webinar, because I actually had that question myself. I couldn't find any clarifying documentation that actually said the process server um, requires a fee, because all their documentation says for the first 31 days, um, it is actually free to use Azure Site Recovery. So what I would do to get a little bit of clarification on that is I would talk to your Microsoft rep um, to get a little bit more information on that particular piece of it because, like I said, their documentation just is not, uh, is not clear on that, sadly. Oh, let's see here. <clears throat> okay. Looking through the questions again. All right. So if I want to try out Windows Server 2016 Hyper-V, what do I need to think about regarding licenses? So that's a good question. Um, so Microsoft provides uh, trial licensing to all of their, their downloads. What you can do is you can go out to the Microsoft Evaluation Center. Uh, I don't know the URL off the top of my head. If you just do a, a quick search for Microsoft Evaluation Center, you can actually um, go out, download an evaluation copy of Windows Server 2016, um, and the license is good for, I want to say, 180 days. Uh, it's 180 days or 120. I don't remember which one. It's, it's, it's a good length of time. Enough time for you to really test it out and, uh, and give it a good go. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Uh, I've got an Altero-related question here. Can we install Altero on a Windows Server 2016 core installation? Yeah, you can install our, our product on top of Windows Server Core. Absolutely. That's actually how I run it uh, inside of my lab. I've got a 2012 R2 core server um, that runs our software. So, yeah, definitely. Um, let's see. Again, keep your questions coming. I've got a couple of more here I can, uh, I can go through. Um, let's see. Uh, does Hyper-V use the equivalent of EVC? So, yes, there is an option in Hyper-V for EVC. Um, when you've got different hosts with different, different uh, hypervisor types, um, the big difference is, is instead of it being kind of a cluster-wide thing, again, kind of the same thing as the, as, the, um, as the HA settings, it's on a per VM setting. Uh, so what you have to do is you go into the virtual machine settings, and under the processor, there's a checkbox for CPU compatibility. You just check that checkbox, and that VM is good to go for jumping between hosts with different CPU types. Um, again, kind of the same. Uh, you got the same considerations you have to take with VMware. 
Um, it's not going to work when you jump between different brands. So you can't go from like Intel to AMD, um, but different, you know, different versions of, of Intel CPUs or different versions of AMD CPUs. Um, that compatibility checkbox in the VM settings takes care of that. <clears throat> well, let's see. I think that about wraps it up for us. Um, let me see here. I think we've got time for one more. Let me keep looking through the list here. <clears throat> Let me expand my form, make it a little easier to look through. There we go. Um, <clears throat> let's see. <clears throat> uh, looks like another question about our product. Can VMware backup be recovered? to a Hyper-V host and vice versa. And uh, currently, no, we cannot do cross hypervisor restores with our product. It's um, if you're running a VM on a Hyper-V host, it has to be restart, restored to a Hyper-V host. It could be any Hyper-V host um, or VMware host has to go to a, any VMware host. So, yep. Um, and uh, will this, uh, will this, is this session being recorded? Yes, we, we did record today's session. We are keeping a copy of the questions. And again, be sure to keep an eye out for the Q&A post that will be coming up in the next week or two on altero.com slash VMware. And again, I'll, uh, I'll make sure that the slide deck is part of that post as well. <clears throat> so with that in mind, uh, again, any questions I didn't have time for today, I'll go ahead and make sure that we get them um, get them covered inside of the Q&A section of the follow-up post. And other than that, I will let everybody get back to their day. And uh, thanks for joining the webinar today. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.